Hi, everybody. Uh, welcome to this virtual panel that we've put together. Uh, my name is Peter Armstrong. I'm a business journalist with CBC News uh, here in Toronto. Uh, and I'm, I'm really just honored and, and touched that the organization would even think of me to, to put this together and to try to help MC uh, a very august panel. It, it's it's an incredibly complex, but an incredibly important time. You know, the, the United Nations has called this year the start of the decade of action. Uh, you know, what, what we're calling ambitious measures and accelerated solutions to the world's biggest problems. And we were really making some progress. Real traction was being made. And then all of a sudden, everything, not just this, but everything else too, was derailed by COVID. And I mean, the thing I've been asking myself a lot is, well, if everything else is changing, why not address some of the, the issues uh, around these sustainable goals and, and try to change not just what we're doing, but how we think about what we're doing. So what the panel today is going to try to look at and try to address, along with you guys in the public, and we'll get a Q&A section going as well, um, the main themes are just sort of, where are we? Where are we headed? And, and what is that kind of unique position that the Canadian business leaders are in to help drive some of that potential change? Uh, and to do that, I'm, I'm really lucky to have these three amazing panelists. Uh, Cynthia Shanks is with Keurig Dr. Pepper Canada. She's been there since 2012. Uh, and is now acts as the director of communications and sustainability. Obviously worked with that company very closely with the recycling industry and the development and launch of the, uh, the recyclable K-cup pods. Uh, but lots of perspective on, on where corporate Canada is at, what it's like to be in charge of sustainability within an organization that big. Uh, so I'm looking forward to hearing what she has to say. Brian Gallant, of course, is the former premier of New Brunswick. Most of us know him as the youngest first minister, I think, in Canada's history. He'll tell us all about that, I'm sure. Uh, but he is currently the chief sustainability officer at, uh, at a really interesting NGO called Global Canada. And one of the things that he's been doing of late is, is meeting with and interviewing C-suite level leaders across corporate Canada compiling a sense of, of what do we know and, and how is the problem seen and, and where, does, where does corporate Canada believe the solution may lie. Uh, this is also going to be a bilingual panel and a bilingual discussion. Uh, so I just want to point out at the bottom of your screen is a translator button and if you click on that, you'll be able to get floor translation as we switch back and forth into French. And to, to introduce my next guest, I will do just that, Pauline D'Amboise et la secrétaire générale et vice-présidente de gouvernance et développement durable au mouvement des caisses des jardins. Euh, ceci est le plus grand, je pense, le plus grand fédération des caisses populaires en Amérique du Nord. Uh, and that, my friends, is our panel. And to get the conversation going, I really just want to hand things off to our three panelists in order uh, that I just introduced them and let them just sort of set the table of, of why this conversation needs to be happening now, what we, think, uh, what we think we can add to it, and then we'll broaden the conversation out from there. So Cynthia, why don't we start with you? I'm happy to be there with you uh, today. Thank you, Peter. Um, first, I want to ensure that everyone, everybody kind of knows who Keurig Dr. Pepper is. Um, in 2018, basically, uh, Dr. Pepper, Snapple, Snapple Group, and uh, Keurig Green Mountain uh, merged together to form Keurig Dr. Pepper, um, the first company to combine hot and cold beverages um, at scale in North America. We own brands like uh, Keurig, Vanut, uh, Mud Fruit Station, uh, Clamato, Canada Dry, and many more. Um, and so with 25,000 employees in North America, we became um, a greater force for a uh, positive impact. Our Drink Well, Do Good sustainability platform um, co covers basically four areas of uh, focus, environment, supply chain, health and well-being, and communities. And we've developed uh, robust sustainability targets um, for those four areas. Among those, we've committed uh, to improve the lives of 1 million people in our coffee supply chain by the end of 2020. Um, so we're almost uh, there. We're closing up on that goal. And we've also committed to 100% responsibly sourced coffee uh, by 2020 to make sure that our coffee is produced in respect of the environment, but also of the people who harvest it um, so that they get you know, fair wages um, and uh, good working conditions. 
KDP is actually the, for the greatest um, or largest purchaser of fair trade coffee in the world, and that for nine years in a row looking up uh, to the, that 10 years. Um, and May is fair trade month, so I'm, I'm also proud to mention that today. Um, we're committed to reducing our environmental footprint, of course, with many goals associated with that. Um, launching new SBTI goal this uh, summer um, and eliminating, eliminating uh, packaging waste is definitely a big focus of us, for sure. Uh, designing packaging with you know, smart, uh, design in mind, recyclability, recyclability and compostability um, objectives, and reducing the amount of material that we're using. We've also, as you're, you said, the transition our K-Cup pods to recyclable format um, at the end of 2018, and we're working uh, towards incorporating 30% of recycled materials in all our packagings uh, by 2025. Definitely believe that circular economy is the path forward to a more sustainable future. Um, using PCR in our packaging is one thing, but we're also, uh, we've launched recently our first uh, coffee maker, so brewer made with uh, recycled, uh, recycled plastics. Um, and that plastic is coming from Canada. So that's uh, also an exciting uh, project we're working on. And I think that uh, prioritizing industry, um, cross-industry collaboration is, is very key um, to help us kind of move beyond our individual commitments to uh, more collective actions. Um, of course, we have a lot of uh, local community uh, support program in place all year long, but since the beginning of this uh, COVID outbreak, we definitely put a big focus there. Um, we've been supporting actively Food Banks Canada with product donations um, and fueling the frontline workers also throughout the country uh, with coffee. Um, our production facilities have been operating at full capacity since the beginning of the outbreak, uh, as coffee and beverages are considered an essential services. Um, and it's been just amazing to see how our employees have kind of come together um, to deliver those products, even, you know, as, as, as they had to adapt to extremely uh, challenging situations and, and measures um, to ensure their health and safety. So it's, it's, um, it's been quite a journey um, the, these past couple of weeks. Um, so I, I believe that's it for my high level uh, introduction. That's good. And, and I, I think it's a great sort of sense of, of you know, where, where we take this conversation. Brian, why don't you pick it up from there and remind us, I, I Global uh, 2020 is one of those, those great organizations that I don't think tons of people know a ton about. So maybe give us a quick headline on, on what the NGO is as well. Absolutely. So, uh, first off, thank you very much. Merci beaucoup, Peter. Merci beaucoup aux organisateurs et organisatrices pour l'invitation. And thanks to everybody listening and, of course, to uh, the fellow uh, panelists as well for your time. Uh, so, essentially, this is what I'm up to. I'm a senior advisor at a public affairs firm called Navigator, as well as a special advisor to the president of Ryerson University on innovation, cybersecurity, and law. And working, as you mentioned, Peter, with Global Canada, an NGO based out of Montreal. Uh, the Global Canada has uh, amongst its uh, priorities a few things, but maybe the overarching one is to try and find ways in which we can get Canadians and Canadian initiatives, NGOs, projects, working with the international counterparts. Uh, so it's a really great organization that does a lot of good for uh, the country and the world. Uh, what I'm working on specifically with Global Canada is a project looking at the relationship between business and society. So it's a very uh, maybe general uh, term, if you will, but it, it really is for those that would be following some of the conversations happening in North America and around the world. It's about the purpose of the corporation, shared value, responsible capitalism, uh, stakeholder capitalism, all of these sort of movements that have been afoot over the last little while that are all sort of pointing towards uh, people wondering, asking, maybe uh, strongly encouraging businesses to play a bit of a different role in society. So what we're doing is, is trying to find out what types of pressures, expectations, opportunities, challenges that the business community is feeling because of these movements. How can others, uh, whether they be accelerators such as academia, governments, uh, other NGOs, um, people that are, are experts, uh, professional service firms, whatever it might be, can do to help Canadian businesses 
be able to accelerate if they're trying to look into uh, these movements and, and transition into them. And of course, we also will want to make sure that we link into some of the international initiatives so that Canadian businesses, NGOs, and all the people that are involved in this are contributing and also learning from what's happening across the globe. I've been, as you mentioned, Peter, uh, doing interviews with uh, C-suite executives, as well as what we have called accelerators. Uh, and this is to get a sense of what's happening in the country, what are some of the hurdles that remain, what are some of the ways in which we can support each other and co-create this sort of new modernized capitalism that, uh, that is uh, really more inclusive and sustainable. Uh, so to do so, I've had about 85 interviews over the last uh, few months across the country with uh, CEOs, chairs, directors, VPs, and of course, uh, academics, uh, accelerators, whether they're professional service firms, other uh, institutes and, and uh, NGOs trying to do similar things. Uh, and with that, I look forward to telling you a little bit about uh, what we've learned through all those amazing interviews, and uh, we'll have a more fulsome report come out in the next few weeks with all the findings. All right, looking forward to it. Uh, and just a reminder to anybody who does need interpretation, uh, that little globe button down at the bottom, you just click on that and you, your audio will switch back and forth, uh, whether you need French or English interpretation. Pauline, à toi. Donc, comme à la base, les objectifs de développement durable, c'est une question d'inclusion. Je félicite les organisateurs de permettre autant en anglais qu'en français la conférence. Donc, moi, je suis à l'emploi de Desjardins depuis 35 ans euh, et euh, je suis responsable de l'implantation du développement durable depuis 2003. Mais ce qu'il faut savoir, c'est que comme groupe financier coopératif, le plus grand en Amérique du Nord, comme vous le mentionnez, écoutez, c'est 3 000 administrateurs élus, c'est 45 000 employés, c'est une, une, une entreprise qui est pan-canadienne, très ancrée au plan coopératif au niveau euh, du Québec et de l'Ontario, mais avec des compagnies d'assurance qui partagent les mêmes valeurs euh, dans les autres provinces euh, canadiennes. Alors, euh, ce que je pourrais en dire autour de notre positionnement en développement durable, je vous le mentionnais, la politique a été adoptée en 2005. On a travaillé comme toutes les organisations euh, au niveau de nos pratiques de gestion d'abord, sachant que plus ça allait aller, plus il y allait avoir de la demande pour euh, développer euh, un offre, un accompagnement qui s'inscrirait à l'intérieur du développement durable. Donc, pendant quelques années, on a beaucoup axé sur cette réponse justement aux besoins. Ça, c'est la partie, je dirais, de, de l'offre de services de Desjardins, mais il y a aussi le rôle socio-économique de Desjardins qui est très, très important. On le voit aujourd'hui dans une crise comme la COVID, à quel point le modèle coopératif est des plus pertinents pour rejoindre les objectifs de développement durable. D'ailleurs, nous, on suit depuis 2017, on a commencé à intégrer dans notre rapport de responsabilité sociale et coopérative les objectifs de développement durable. On a d'ailleurs pris des engagements en 2017 fermes par rapport aux objectifs de l'accord de Paris qui se sont traduits notamment outre le fait de réduire notre empreinte carbone, d'investir dans les énergies renouvelables, le cœur de l'engagement, c'était d'intégrer la finance responsable, c'est-à-dire d'intégrer les critères environnement, société et de gouvernance, non pas juste dans nos pratiques de gestion, mais dans l'ensemble du modèle d'affaires de Desjardins. Et pour ce faire, pour aller dans la continuité des objectifs de développement durable, on a adhéré aux trois grands engagements internationaux. Depuis dix ans, on était déjà dans les principes d'investissement responsable. On a signé en 2019 les principes d'assurance responsable. On a été la première institution financière canadienne à signer des principes bancaires responsables. Et ça, c'est facile de signer euh, des engagements. La, la, le, le côté, je dirais, le plus corsé, c'est vraiment de le rendre opérationnel. Donc, la décision du conseil d'administration, sous l'égide du comité de direction, a formé un comité euh, constitué de vice-présidents qui a la responsabilité de faire arriver les encadrements, donc de faire en sorte que notre modèle se transforme et que ça soit cohérent de bout en bout de notre groupe. Donc, ces critères ESG vont s'appliquer autant dans nos activités avec notre clientèle qu'à qu qu travers nos pratiques de gestion également. Et ce qu'il faut voir derrière, c'est toute l'évolution du système financier à l'échelle internationale. Je pense que la COVID va accélérer aussi cette attente-là au niveau des populations et un modèle d'institution de, financière comme Desjardins euh, est tout à fait prêt à y répondre. Donc, euh, ça sur quoi on travaille actuellement, c'est vraiment, euh, de, comme je le disais, là, on a un comité qui travaille à définir les positionnements, mais surtout 
on consulte notre base. Notre prochain congrès euh, d'orientation en 2021 va porter notamment sur la question du développement durable, mais sur le niveau d'ambition. Le niveau d'ambition, c'est-à-dire jusqu'où on va vouloir répondre et comment on va pouvoir répondre aux attentes de notre clientèle, quelle sorte de rôle on va jouer comme leader socio-économique. Tout à l'heure, on parlait de l'économie circulaire, l'économie de service, l'économie de partage. Comment une institution financière et plus largement les institutions financières vont pouvoir contribuer à cela. Et après ça, par rapport au changement climatique, quel genre d'ambition également on, on va voir se donner, euh, étant entendu que nous, on s'inscrit vraiment dans une perspective de transition énergétique juste et probablement qu'on aura l'occasion de, de partager là-dessus. Et pour rendre ça encore plus profond dans l'intégration, euh, on est allé faire un balisage international pour voir justement quels étaient ces niveaux d'ambition-là. On a fait faire un, un audit interne au niveau de, de l'application de notre politique de, de développement durable. Et aussi, on est en train de documenter toute la vigie pour soutenir le prochain plan stratégique de Desjardins sur l'horizon 2021-2024. Donc, c'est un peu là-dessus qu'on travaille euh, actuellement, mais ça devient comme quelque chose maintenant, la nouvelle façon de faire des affaires dans le secteur des services financiers. Peut-être que je m'arrêterai là dans un premier temps là, pour euh, vous dire un peu euh, l'évolution des choses chez nous. It was such a fascinating glimpse into, I mean, frankly, life inside a bank and, and a massive Canadian institution that has embraced this level of change, I think tells us about the progress that has been made and gives us a sense of where the road forward is. Uh, and so, Brian, if I can come back to you, just because of your, the research that you've been doing and the conversations you've been having with Corporate Canada, I wonder if you can give us some insight into where we are and, and specifically kind of, you know, what, what is it that Canada can do and what is our strength in this that, that can sort of move the ball forward, not just in terms of, 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 you know, actually getting progress, but in terms of having this broader conversation and, and, and flushing things out a little bit. Well, a few things. Uh, thank you, Peter. So uh, first off, I'd say that the Canadian business community um, are, are well aware that there are added pressures being put on to businesses, that, that the way that business was conducted a few decades ago just isn't the way that it's going to be conducted in the future. And uh, really right now, they're all trying to figure that out. And, and I think a lot of them are, are doing a good job at it. But with that said, uh, I think it's in the interest of all Canadians and, and, uh, uh, and all stakeholders that we do everything we can to help businesses accelerate that transition. So that would be sort of comment number one. Uh, comment number two, the interviews in which we did, we actually, in our interview guide, don't mention climate change. We don't mention inequalities. We don't mention maybe the, the uh, mistrust that we are starting to see and feel in, in institutions. Um, but yet almost all of those topics come up in every interview. So I find that really fascinating because the frame really is about the role of business in society, the relationship between the two, how it's evolving, um, what are the expectations. But those topics are coming up organically, which I think is all that much more powerful and leads me to believe, again, that the business community recognize that things are changing and these are topics that are not just uh, public policy in nature in the sense that public policy coming from governments or, or maybe other stakeholders, it really is everybody, including businesses. Um, one challenge, however, that I, that I certainly have seen doing the interviews is when it comes to the SDGs, uh, which I know is, a, is obviously a big part of the conversation uh, at this conference. The business community in Canada um, sort of admit, and, and remember for those listening that, that I'm doing interviews and I'm asking the people that I'm interviewing what their impressions are of the business community uh, and, and sort of the movements and all that. So, so keep that in mind uh, in terms of how sort of empirical this is. But nonetheless, the self-assessment of the Canadian business community is that there's a very low awareness of the SDGs um, some would maybe spin it to say uh, low engagement. Now, with that said, it's really fascinating to sort of see the, the nuances in those answers, however. Uh, if somebody is from or is talking about or has the impression of a larger corporation within Canada that is multinational, that maybe has markets in several regions around the globe, they are going to tend to say that the awareness of SDGs is a lot higher. They're either they'll admit that it's most likely because of that structure that's different to others, or that will be, it seems like their impression. Uh, if they are resource-based, they seem to have a further, uh, further chance of being engaged on the SDGs. 
but even large corporations with maybe their primary markets really being the U.S. Um, and maybe, you know, obviously having a little bit around the world, but primarily being to the U.S., the, the SDG awareness seems to be lowered. So what it leads me to believe is that when there's a bit of a necessity, Canadian business businesses and, and their leaders will engage with the SDGs as they're trying to get into other regions around the world, they're doing work around the world, and in other parts of the world, the SDGs may be more prevalent and important. Uh, if they only do business with the U.S. because the U.S. doesn't seem to be that engaged, um, I would argue maybe on a lot of multinational, multi-international, um, multinational and, and international institutions, uh, including the SDGs, that their awareness and engagement is lower as a Canadian business. Uh, the the startups and sort of maybe the you know lack of a better way of describing it, the sort of younger generation of businesses probably a little bit more engaged on this topic. Uh, but really, I think we have a challenge. Uh, in Canada when it comes to engagement. So when you when you ask Peter, what could we do? I think Canadians, we have sort of embedded in us this, this concept of doing good and this concept of really a stakeholder capitalism and all the movements. I think we, we sort of want to embody that and I think we do to some extent very well, maybe more so than, than others around the world. So that's really good. But to really try to help the institutions that are going to be important moving forward and, and things that are important like the SDGs, I think would be something that Canada could really contribute moving forward. Cynthia, I'd ask you to pick up on that, if only because I think you have a unique insight into how a multinational corporation works and, and what the trends have been. It's the, these are not theoretical issues in your company. Yeah, for sure. I mean, um, if I'm looking only at the, the coffee portion of our business and how much, you know, sustainability and, and climate change have big impacts on coffee and the availability or the, the sustainability of coffee over time, um, this, is, this is huge. This is very important to a business like ours. Um, so so it's, it's just kind of natural for us that we've always been so much focused on sustainability and working with our coffee farmers to ensure that we protect those crops um, to, to, to have a product to sell in 15 and, and 30 years from now. Um, we know that climate change have a very direct um, impact on, on coffee crops um, and making sure that we also, you know, provide uh, quality of living for our coffee farmers and, and get their families, you know, wanting to continue to, uh, to nurture that crop and, and work on coffee farms in the future is very essential. Um, so, I think that from the get go as a coffee company, um, you you have to be into sustainability. It's 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 part of who we are. Um, so it was always for us um, um, areas where we we've been very committed and working very hard um, and and reducing our entire um, carbon footprint kind of fits into that. So just naturally, as, as we always worked within the sustainability area and having different um, 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 focuses areas, basically, that we're working on, um, it was natural for us to link all of those to specific um, SDGs in, in ensuring that we contrib contribute, basically, to this uh, overarching on va switcher en français, parler avec Pauline encore. Euh, et Pauline, quand on entend ce que Brian a dit, ce que Cynthia a dit au sujet de euh, le, les tendances euh, mm -hmm. aux affaires au Canada, est-ce est -ce que c'est plus simple quand on parle d'un d'un case populaire au lieu d'un d'un un banque plus traditionnel de, de Bay Street ou Wall Street? Mm -hmm. J'aborderai votre point euh, sous deux aspects. Euh, quand on est un groupe coopératif, premièrement, ça fait partie de l'ADM. Le Mouvement des Jardins a été fondé il y a 120 ans et sa mission est basée sur des dimensions économiques et sociales. Donc, il fallait juste, au moment où la problématique environnementale est survenue, d'ajouter le volet environnemental et ça vient s'intégrer plus naturellement dans la prise de décision. Mais les jardins fait partie d'un écosystème d'institutions financières euh, en concurrence et avec les mêmes impératifs que le secteur bancaire. L'avantage d'un groupe coopératif, outre le fait de l'avoir dans l'ADN, c'est vraiment euh, de, de pouvoir aller à la base, vérifier quelles sont leurs attentes. Et des fois, c'est un peu plus long, mais une fois qu'on a l'adhésion, ça va beaucoup plus rapidement. 
En contrepartie, puis je pense que ça, c'est important pour le milieu des affaires en général, c'est que là, l'écosystème international au niveau de la finance est en train d'intégrer les préoccupations véhiculées par les ODD, mais comme je le disais tout à l'heure, beaucoup sous l'angle de la finance responsable, donc de l'intégration des facteurs ESG. Et ça part euh, véritablement du Conseil de la stabilité financière hein, qui régule les institutions financières. Vous savez que Mark Carney est un des, une des étoiles par rapport à ça. Il a formé un groupe de travail avec M. Bloomberg. Ils ont formulé des recommandations, notamment sur ce qui touche les changements climatiques. Euh, nous, maintenant, on participe à l'échelle internationale sous l'égide des Nations unies euh, à des travaux pour justement voir comment tout ça peut s'implanter dans le secteur financier. Et si ça s'implante dans le secteur financier, c'est clair que ça va avoir des impacts par la suite sur la clientèle, autant au niveau des entreprises qu'au niveau euh, des particuliers. Euh, je dirais qu'une nouvelle tendance actuellement, regardez la consolidation des agences de notation. Les agences de notation financière acquièrent maintenant les agences de notation extra-financière. Donc, prenez Moody's qui a euh, acquis euh, Vigio Iris et nous, on vient de faire, euh, d'être noté par rapport à cette nouvelle agence-là où on va nous donner une cote en fonction des, de l'intégration des critères ESG. Donc, des investisseurs qui vont être intéressés à participer à nos émissions vont aller regarder et vont pouvoir voir notre cote. Et ça, toutes les entreprises publiques sont assujetties à ça et c'est un mouvement qui est vraiment lancé. Une, une institution financière aujourd'hui qui tarde à le faire euh, va être pénalisée plus tard éventuellement. La Banque du Canada vient d'intégrer dans les six vulnérabilités du système financier canadien euh, toute la question des changements climatiques notamment. Donc, ce n'est pas juste le climat, hein, il y a bien d'autres questions là, au niveau social. Mais regardez comment c'est en train de dessiner cette industrie-là. Je ferai peut-être un petit topo un peu plus global là, de la question. Um, Brian, when, when the, the, the line that stood out for me uh, that Pauline was just talking about is, is a more natural sort of integration of, of the ideas. It, what can we learn as you talk to, to sort of C-suite from to, to corporate leaders? Because as you say, you're talking to, 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 to founders and, and new companies as well. When we talk to them, what can we learn from companies that have, have adopted these ideas and made innovation a, a centerpiece of, of where they're going forward and, and sustainable goals a part of their ethos from a long time back? What can we learn from how they did it to help companies that are trying to figure out how to, ha how to make that happen more quickly now? Well, it's really, it's really interesting because I, I haven't met a business leader. Um, I haven't interviewed a business leader that doesn't believe that uh, helping your stakeholders, doing everything you can to protect the environment, helping tackle challenges facing the globe isn't important. Uh, they all think it's important. They all want to step up. They all want to do what they can. What's, what's interesting, I, I will admit too, at times there will be a bit of a disconnect between the business leaders and the, what we deem the accelerators and their impressions of each other as well, which, which is probably normal, uh, but, but a bit of a challenge, right? When we, when we think that we need to collectively work together to sort of advance everybody's contribution, but also uh, help businesses contribute to these important topics. Um, so, so that would be the first comment. The, the second comment I would make is um, business leaders, uh, I think all see that things have changed. Um, and, you know, take a little sidestep there for a second. One, one good example of how things have changed, I think there's a, a pretty strong and clear repudiation of the sort of Friedman doctrine that uh, business and corporate leaders need to focus on nothing but profits for shareholders or owners or whatever the entity or structure may be. So I think, I think they, they realize that that change has happened. And many of them over the years, uh, and if not right now, they're sort of rushing to catch up and really change the way the organization works to be a lot more stakeholder oriented, uh, to be thinking about their impact in, in many different ways. I certainly would like to see the SDGs play a big role in helping businesses determine their impact. Uh, I think it's probably the best, uh, one of the best vehicles to do so. Uh, so so I, I really do think that's happening. Um, but, but again, they all, not only have they been trying over the last little while, or they're trying to rush to, to get where they need to be, they all see it coming uh, to a stage where this is going to be not only the right thing to do, but crucial to stay in business and to be successful. So it's really fascinating because as you can imagine, like any topic, you'll have people that see it different ways. Maybe they'll be, you know, somewhere on the spectrum in, in terms of how important this is. Um, but every single one of them would acknowledge that because of younger generations 
increased expectations on businesses, the importance that they're placing on the topics of climate change, of, in, of addressing inequalities, of, of you know, social cohesion. Uh, they all feel that they have to do more today and they'll even have to do more moving forward to make sure that they're still relevant as a business. Uh, so it's, it's really fascinating to see that sort of that balance and dance because you still have you know, some, I'd say, hangover of, of the sort of shareholder primacy uh, there's still some people that may think that's the way it's supposed to be, but I haven't met many, to, to be honest. But, um, but none, nonetheless, even somebody that may still think that that has a place in the in the business community still sees lots of change coming down the road. Okay, uh, we've got I think 14 minutes left, and we want to make sure we get questions from those of you in the audience. There's a hundred people in the audience at one point or another, uh, and and these things are always so much better when we can hear your input. Julie is going to be compiling some of those questions. So at the bottom of your screen, there's a, a Q&A function. Click on that, let us know your questions so I, I can get them out uh, to, our, to our panelists. The thing I, we haven't really even touched on yet is, well, I, I, I think uh, Pauline touched on it, I, I think most eloquently about what opportunity there is in a crisis like this and, and, and how do we do business differently? And therefore, how do we address the future problems differently? Uh, and I wonder, Cynthia, is, is that something, I, I mean, we are so knee deep in just managing an actual crisis. You guys have supply chain issues that I can't even get my head around, but it, has the conversation within businesses begun to turn to what we can do to marshal better resources to have a more efficient, more sustainable uh, company in the long run? For sure. I think that it's, it, it was part of the, the, the reflection from the beginning, right? Um, we, we entered into this very challenging situation and right from the get-go, we had to adapt so much and change so much um, how, we, how we do things, but how we view just the business in, in, in its entirety. So um, th that, that rebound, I guess, and, and we, we like to think, you know, that, that um, synergies between businesses is what will make us stronger in the future. It's, it's something that we've always, collaboration is, is key. It's something that we've always really uh, worked on and, and, and focused on partnerships. Um, so it's, it's definitely something that we're looking at. How can we um, better work um, in synergies with other organizations to, um, you know, have more of this, um, um, be more, more self-sufficient when we're thinking locally, um, be able to um, adapt our, our ways of working. Also, our, our people are working from home uh, more than ever, of course, uh, and it's been forced on us, but we realized so many things through that. Um, so it's, it's been part of, of um, everything that we reflect on, I think that what will define us is is how we rise from this crisis. Um, we need to to rethink our work life balance. Um, it's it's all things that we 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 have active discussions with our employees uh, all across North America. Um, it challenged you know the the notion of of do we need that many cars on roads um, at, at any given time and point, you know? Um, so it's, it's a lot of things that the, the company is, is looking at to be able to offer um, flexibility to our supply chain, flexibility for our employees. Um, I think that it's, it's very sad what's, what's of course happening with COVID, but it also gives us, gives us a great opportunity to uh, bounce, bounce back from that and um, transform ourselves more rapidly than ever. I, I, we've seen our, our, our team members being so creative um, in, in, in these past few weeks. Um, it's just incredible, you know, so I, I, I feel like, um, we can definitely come out stronger. Okay, uh, I think we, we have about 10 minutes left. And so I'm gonna give the last word to Pauline before we, we start taking some audience questions. And two quick notes. One is that apparently you can upvote questions. So if you go into that Q&A function and you see a question you like, you can upvote it. So that'll have a higher likelihood of getting to us the, the redditization of, of Q&As, I guess that is. Uh, and second, this is from Julie about the audio issues that, that seem to be still happening. And I'm not sure if they're French to English or English to French. 
But what she says is that the audio issues are stemming from the panelist settings, so that's us. Uh, if they have a language selected, you can't hear the interpreter or can't hear the audio, and they're trying to fix that. So, uh, peut-être nous autres, on peut juste checker pour voir si on, est, on a sélectionné une langue. Uh, je ne sais pas où exactement ça se fait. En tout cas, uh, si vous avez sélectionné une langue, peut-être on peut désélectionner uh, pour le... le de fin de cette conversation. OK. Um, Pauline, au début, tu as parlé de le modèle coopératif dans une crise comme COVID. Mm -hmm. qu Qu'est-ce qu qui, qu qui change et, et, et quelle est l'opportunité euh, de, de ce moment-là? En fait, euh, je pense que ça nous a permis de mettre le modèle coopératif en action à puissance euh, 10, euh, parce que la, la, la mission du mouvement des jardins, c'est de contribuer au mieux être économique et social des personnes et des collectivités. Et le président travaille depuis euh, quelques années euh, à renforcer la culture, et ça c'est important. À la, la culture, et il y en a une culture au sein du mouvement des jardins, il n'y en a pas 40, c'est de toujours travailler dans l'intérêt de nos membres et clients. Et quand on regarde, parce que nous, on a vécu deux crises successives, toutes les décisions d'affaires ont été prises dans l'intérêt de nos membres et clients. Ça s'est traduit par des mesures d'allègement, des protections, euh, un appui aux, aux petites entreprises. Il y a plein de programmes. On vient de lancer le Fonds Grand Mouvement là, de 150 millions pour soutenir l'entrepreneuriat dans toutes les régions du Québec. Donc, ce que ça permet de faire, c'est d'aller à l'essentiel. Je dois vous dire que le processus décisionnel est d'ailleurs plus rapide parce que dans le fond, on s'attaque à une crise, on connaît les aboutissants de ça. Tout le monde est concentré sur l'importance de soutenir les personnes dans leur vie quotidienne et aussi de soutenir l'économie. Puis on sait qu'au Québec, au Canada, il y a beaucoup, il y a de la grande entreprise, mais il y a aussi beaucoup de petites et moyennes entreprises. Donc, ce que ça a changé, la crise, c'est d'accélérer le processus décisionnel, d'être très, très aligné sur notre mission première. Et même si les résultats financiers, on vient d'avoir nos résultats, Là, sont moins élevés. On est une entreprise tout à fait rentable, très bien capitalisée et on joue notre mission à fond. Donc, on est capable de soutenir ce passage-là. Puis quand l'économie va reprendre, de toute façon, les fondamentaux sont là et ça va reprendre comme ça l'était avant. Donc, euh, je pense que le modèle coopératif en ce sens-là est capable de s'adapter très, très rapidement à une réalité comme celle-là. I found the questions and I want to try to get to these because we really do only have six minutes left and, and my questions are never as good as the audience. So uh, a question from Nima for Brian. Why is awareness so low for SDGs in the Canadian companies and businesses and how do we improve and increase that awareness? Well, uh, really quickly to repeat myself a little bit, I do think that those that are geared towards the US, unfortunately, because the US are not prioritizing and engaging very much with the SDGs, they don't necessarily see the need to. Uh, whereas I think the argument we should be using for those types of businesses and any other business is that, as I think as a nation, we should be trying to diversify and not be as dependent on the U.S. as a market. Uh, certainly engaging on the SDGs is going to help us do that. And uh, the old Gretzky adage, uh, let's not go where the puck is, let's go where the puck's going to be. Uh, we, I think, can say, safely say the SDGs and that concept, at least, will play a larger role moving forward. Uh, so might as well start to get used to using them and using that type of mindset uh, where the economy is going to be there fairly soon. Okay, the top question, and I'll put this to you, Cynthia, what did your company have to unlearn in order to take on SDGs? To unlearn? It's a good question. It's right? a tricky one, I would say. <laughs> um, I think we just need to challenge, you know, our, our old ways of working. We, we always need to um, try to redefine the, the way we're looking at our products, um, the way we're looking at our supply chain, um, trying to find better ways to, 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 to think through, the, through those. Um, so for me, it's really innovation, I would say. Um, yeah, and it goes abroad, you know, it, I mean, it's all across uh, the organization in, in all sectors um, of the organization. Uh, Tom Travinsky has an interesting question. My question for the leaders here is, quote, how do we break out of our silos and reach across partisanship and win a coalition for action across political perspectives? Pauline, tu as parlé un peu de tel sujet-là. 
euh, c'est quoi la réponse? Il n'y a pas une réponse, mais, mais qu'est-ce qu'on peut faire pour, euh, pour améliorer cette situation? En fait, je, je pense que, te, puis je, je, je reprends des propos de tout à l'heure, euh, tout le monde aspire à avoir une économie qui est plus équilibrée. À quelque part, il faut trouver des forums, mais c'en est un aujourd'hui, mais trouver des forums où on peut mettre en commun cet objectif-là et il va falloir aussi s'assurer d'être à l'écoute de ce que les des difficultés que vivent les autres secteurs qui peuvent peut-être sont moins performants par rapport à l'intégration des objectifs de développement durable. Ça va être vraiment par le dialogue par le partage des pratiques, de générer ces occasions-là, de, de se comprendre, parce qu'à la fin, moi, je pense que tout le monde aspire à ça. Mais maintenant, c'est un travail, on dit en québécois, de jus de bras. C'est vraiment d'en de, de, discuter dans nos industries respectives, de participer à des travaux à l'échelle internationale, de solliciter nos gouvernements aussi, euh, parce qu'il y a quand même des positionnements qui ont été pris et d'être présent comme société civile pour faire avancer les politiques publiques. Parce que dans le fond, le milieu des affaires, ce qu'il y a de besoin, c'est vraiment d'une orientation qui est claire et d'une stabilité dans les politiques publiques et de prévoir de l'appui ou de prévoir, pour ceux qui vraiment ne s'engagent pas, des, des éléments qui vont les, 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 les obliger à quelque part de, de s'en préoccuper. Ça fait que je pense que plusieurs intervenants qui ont un rôle à jouer, et certainement qu'avec l'engagement du Canada, parce que je suis allée visiter, là, ça faisait un moment que j'étais allée sur le site là, pour voir comment tout ça s'articulait au Canada, tout est bien, là, ce qui est inscrit là, là maintenant, mais comment on engage les gens, bien, ça va être de trouver la vision commune et les bénéfices communs qu'il y a autour de ça. Donc, euh, c'est peut-être ce que je pourrais dire euh, sur le sujet. OK, next top rated question. Uh, Cynthia, do you have any examples of how Keurig has helped coffee farmers dealing with the impacts and adaptations required for climate change? Or more broadly, can you please give some examples of how you improve the livelihoods of coffee farmers? Yes. Um, first of all, we don't do that alone. Um, so uh, we make sure that 100% of the coffee that we buy is certified. Uh, we're working with different certification models, fair trade, RFA, OOTS. And then we add the, a, a layer to that um, of impact investment. Uh, we're working with organizations like Soko uh, Blue Harvest, uh, Root Capital, and investing in those community um, to, you know, gender equality training um, to make sure that they, they learn how to properly uh, treat uh, water uh, that comes out uh, when, they, when they harvest the coffee and process the coffee. Um, there's a lot of agronomy trainings uh, that we're doing. Over the years, there's communities where we, we've been in relationship with them for more than 20 years. Um, I've had the pleasure to visit those communities multiple times myself um, in Honduras, in Colombia, in Kenya um, and and it, it's it's incredible that the amount of projects you know building schools building health clinics um, but really focusing on getting getting them to be self-sufficient um, and and giving them the tools um, so that they can kind of pursue um, those in the future okay we have a, about 10 seconds left before we get cut off here so I really want to thank you three for being on this panel. I learned a ton and I'd really like to just thank the organizers. It, it, was, it was quite a remarkable thing to be involved in. So thank, thank you, you for this and thank you to everybody. Thank you so much. Bye.